Welcome, everyone. I am Les B. Manley, but when I'm known as Sarah Thompson, I'm the Western Labrador representative for the Writers' Alliance Board of Directors. We're marking Pride Week with a series of kid-friendly readings presented by the Writers' Alliance of Newfoundland and Labrador and Raise Up Fundraising. For anyone not familiar with the Alliance, we are a nonprofit organization working to support and inspire writers at all levels and stages of their careers in the province. For more information on our programs and services, please go to wanl.ca, W-A-N-L.ca, or check us out on social media. During Pride, it is important to remember how fortunate we are to be able to live our lives as our most authentic selves, and that there are still many places where people can't. We take this time not only to raise a flag and gather to celebrate the strides we have made as a community, but also to remember and celebrate those that marched and sacrificed so it could be possible for us. We're so happy to present this event to inspire a love of reading in youth, but also present a deeper lesson of diversity and acceptance and offer children positive and unabashedly queer role models. Drive Storytime is collecting on behalf of Raise Up Fundraising Supporting Initiative fundraising events and projects to marginalized persons and groups in Newfoundland and Labrador. If you're able, please consider giving a donation to this amazing organization. On behalf of the board, staff, and members of the association, I would like to wish you all a happy Pride. We hope you enjoy the readings. Hi everyone, I'm Megan, a board member with Raise Up Fundraising, and we're a local nonprofit that raises funds for organizations that support marginalized folks in Newfoundland and Labrador. For this year's St. John's Pride Week, we're happy to announce that we've developed a partnership with the Writers Alliance of Newfoundland and Labrador to bring you four virtual family-friendly drag story times. These drag story times feature the talents of local artists and drag performers, and we would like to sincerely thank them for their participation, as well as the Writers Alliance of Newfoundland and Labrador. We hope you enjoy. Hello, I'm glad you could join me. Today I'm going to read The Last Tree by Michelle Churchill and Ariel Marsh. In the beginning, only three trees grew in the forest. The first tree grew faster than all the others. It reached skyward with its ambitions and dreams. Its trunk was strong and sturdy, with great branches sprawling in all directions. As it grew, it altered its surroundings by creating shade where there had been none, and the roots created small hills and depressions in the ground, drawing rainwater into small pools. However, those same roots were shallow, and this tree was the first to fall. From these fallen branches emerged humans, who set about altering the forest for their own survival, as their tree had. The second tree was not as tall as the first. It could grow in rocky soil or moist bogs. Its roots clung tightly to the earth to hold fast in any storm, from the branches grew flowers that blossomed into berries, sharp and bitter to the taste. It was the food that aided the birds through the cold winter months. The snarling roots sheltered small animals during the fiercest storms. Out of these branches and roots came elves, who had cared for the creatures of the forest as their tree watched over them. In time, this tree also fell, dividing the elves between forest and mountains. Then there was the last tree. Tall yet gnarled, its roots spanned the entirety of the world, allowing it to grow more vibrant than the others. On its bark, mosses and ivy flourished, mushrooms grew at its base, and a great mass of mistletoe bloomed in its upper limbs. All other plants tried to strangle and contain it to keep its legacy at bay. Hard nut seeds fell from the tree to nourish the birds and encourage them to spread its lineage far and wide. Seeds that took to the water became the selkies and mermaids. Seeds spread through the meadow flourished into the tricksters and merrymakers. And the seeds that fell into the shelter of low-lying brush flourished into a beautiful yet dangerous forest, for this was the tree of the fairies. All the bright and new men, elves, and fairies sought to make their way in the growing world, taking what knowledge they could from their trees as the forest grew and changed with all their triumphs and struggles. 
The trees grew and fell as came their time, all save for the last tree. This last tree had scattered its seeds far and wide, and yet when its time came it refused to fall. One seed landed upon its own branches in a growth of moss and ivy that sought to strangle it, and it was in this treacherous mess that the seed took hold and grew anew, taking life from its mother tree, winding its roots through friend and foe alike. While all the men, elves, and fairies struggled to make the world theirs, they watched within the last tree. Nestled away in the midlands, the bells in the high monastery towel told out the start of the day. Farmers in nearby fields attended to their work, cutting into the earth to plant the next season harvest. Within the confines of the monastery, a lone boy sat at a desk, meticulously copying a scroll onto a smaller piece of parchment stretched out before him and held in place by a wooden frame so that it wouldn't slip as he copied the words. He carefully dipped his pen into the inkwell, and with his free hand he propped up his forehead, his fingers entwined into his sandy hair that was so carefully clipped into the style of a monk. In truth, the boy was only a novice, yet he longed to one day trade in his habit for the vestments of a fully-fledged member of the order. Keepers, they were by name, the recorders and caretakers of Impartian history. A portly monk appeared in the doorway. He crossed his arms about his wide chest, tapping a sandaled foot upon the stone floor to get the attention of the boy. It didn't work. Buried in his work, the young novice continued his meticulous copying. Augustus, the monk called, breaking the spell. And glancing up, Augustus returned the pen to the inkwell. He rose slowly from his seat on the bench, passing one longing glance at the parchment. Brother Danier, I didn't see you there, he apologized. Is it time to go already? Brother Danier couldn't help but smile. I told you last night to be ready to go at the morning bells. He strode over to the desk to look over the boy's work. He nodded approvingly. The text of the first tree and such improvement in your penmanship. You think so? Augustus beamed as he wrung his ink-stained hands. Do you think it might be enough to make High Father Podal request reconsider my request to join the order? Sighing heavily, Brother Danier shook his head. You know it isn't up to High Father Podal alone. The Council of High Fathers decided that you're not ready yet. Augustus hung his head, rubbing at an ink spot on his habit sleeve. Maybe I didn't express how important this is to me. Brother Danier's great belly shook with silent mirth as he tried to keep from laughing, lest he upset Augustus further. You've asked to join every year since you were five. I think High Father Podell and the Council know what it means to you. Seeing the disheartened look cross Augustus's face, he added, just because we feel prepared doesn't mean we are. Sometimes the experience of our elders lets them see what we are blind to. You're barely 16, and no one has ever been taken as a full brother of the order that young. But I don't want to leave here. Am I being punished for being too eager? Punished? You think you're being punished, Brother Danier said, placing an arm around Augustus and leading him toward the hall of the main doors. Hi, Father Podell wants you to experience more of the world. You would do well to respect his orders, not mope about here and keep him waiting. The great door was opened, and out on the grounds, the cart was being loaded up with casks of honey and ale to be taken to the nearby town. Other monks assisted the aged High Father into the cart, and they had fashioned a seat for him around the cargo, padding him in with warm blankets and sheepskins. Podell was perhaps the oldest man in Impartia. Thin wisps of snow-white hair circled his head, and his hands were gnarled as the wooden cane he carried. Though frail, his eyes still twinkled with a youthful vigor and often appeared to shift between pale blue and green. Brother Danier helped hitch up the monastery's two donkeys to the cart before climbing into the seat at the front, and Augustus watched as it, as a bee hazily buzzed past his nose, and he sighed longingly as the tiny creature made its way home to its hive. It was the same hive that he and Brother Danier had constructed the spring before. The winter had frayed some of the woven reeds, and Augustus felt the urge to drop everything and make the needed repairs. They will still be here when you return, Podal spoke, his ba voice barely above a whisper. Yes, High Father, Augustus said obediently, climbing into the cart to sit beside the head of the monastery. The cart meandered down the path leading to town. The young novice watched as the only home he had ever known faded into the background. They passed fields and meadows. The countryside was alive with sights and smells of the spring, and farmers and villagers waved as they passed, many quickly bowing low or removing their hats when they realized that High Father Podell traveled among them. 
The High Father rarely left the monastery these days, and seeing how the reverence given to him made Augustus realize how significant it was that Podell was personally seeing him off. He felt a wave of shame, now regretting how he had wanted to disobey and stay home. Brother Danier brought the cart to a stop in front of the King's Tariff Men Station. There was already a crowd forming around the structure. Other boys, all near Augustus's age, gathered near a large barrel behind which Captain of the Tariff Men sat with a thick-bound book, a tattered quill, and a dirty ink pot. With the assistance of the other two, High Father Podell got out of the cart, leaning heavily on his cane as he walked towards the station. I will speak with the commander, Augustus. Go with Brother Danier and get signed in. Obediently, Augustus joined the gathering of boys with Danier close behind him. The captain eyed them shrewdly. So you're the keeper boy we've been expecting, he said in a rasping voice between puffs of his pipe. Augustus nodded politely. Yes, sir. Didn't think the monks were cut out for this sort of thing. Shuffling his sandals anxiously, Augustus was relieved when Danier spoke on his behalf. Augustus is a novice of the order. Traveling the roads of Impartia will teach him valuable lessons before he settles in to become a keeper, Danier said in a tone that suggested he didn't care for their questioning. The captain tapped his pipe on the barrel. All right, then. Sign your mark on the book. You'll do three years as a king's tariff man, keep the king's roads clear of ruffians, and collect his taxes. Hurry up, make your mark, and then we'll get you kitted out. Augustus passed a quick glance to Brother Danier, getting a nod of encouragement, and taking the quill, he dipped in into the dirty ink and neatly inscribed his name upon the parchment. Coughing out a cloud of smoke, the captain pointed to the signature. What's this? he demanded crossly. Cowering. Augustus set the quill down, wondering what he could have done wrong. My name, sir. Showing off is you. Confused and frightened, Augustus lowered his eyes to look at the page. His name was inscribed below rows of scratched X's, and his cheeks flushed red. He was about to apologize for his own literacy when High Father Padel appeared alongside him with none other than the commander next to him. The commander shook Augustus's hand warmly. We welcome you, Augustus. Come along, let's get you and your kit and select a horse for you. The other boys, having watched all this, whispered darkly between themselves, and Augustus caught the voice of one boy scoffing. Look at the dress on that one. Didn't know they let girls in. And Brother Danier leaned in to whisper. Pity those who talk like that. They show cruelty for all that that's all they've known themselves, and it will bring them nothing but unhappiness and ruin. The words did little to help. Augustus could still hear their whispers and feel their eyes upon him. High Father Podell stopped before the entrance to the station. This is where we must part ways for a time. He drew Augustus into a hug. You will do well here, I know it. I don't want to go, Augustus said, fighting tears. You must, Podell said solemnly. There is much you could be doing for Impardia. Go, help all you can, and when you are finished, you will come back to us. Brother Danier wrapped his doughy arms around the small boy, squeezing him tightly. No tears or fuss now, he said, trying to fight back his own urge to cry. Producing a leather band from his habit sleeve, he wrapped it around Augustus's wrist. It had small wooden beads bearing the image of trees and beehives. They were keeper beads, made by the brothers of the order to bring good fortune. Go now, listen to High Father, go help where you can. Augustus nodded obediently, casting one last look to those he considered to be a family before following the commander inside. That is the first chapter. I hope you enjoyed it. The book again is called The Last Tree by Michelle Churchill and Ariel Marsh, if you wish to read it yourself, as there are many more chapters and uh, even the occasional picture for you to enjoy. Thank you.